Hi, Mr. Beats. You're probably judging me right now, but that's okay. In this video, I'm going to be judging justices. That's right, it's a Supreme Court video, heck yeah. 231 years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States sat down and met for the very first time. Chief Justice John Jay, as well as Justices John Rutledge, William Cushing, James Wilson, John Blair, and James Iredell first got together in the Merchants Exchange Building in New York City, which at the time was the country's capital city on February 2nd, 1790. It was mostly just boring procedural stuff. In fact, they didn't even announce their first decision until a year and a half later most of their early decisions in the 1790s had little impact over the entire country, but over time, they would have more and more influence on the federal government. Today, the Supreme Court yields tremendous power. Members of the Supreme Court are called justices. Each justice gets a single vote in deciding the cases argued before it. The Chief Justice facilitates things, which is why they get this special title. Since since 1869, there have been nine justices in the Supreme Court at a time. These justices never have to worry about being elected. They can serve for life if they want to. That said, many do retire before they die. I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to retire after you die. Anyway, if there's a vacancy, the president appoints a new justice, but the Senate has to approve of their appointment. Oh, by the way, there is nothing in the Constitution about qualifications for justices. Heck, technically, you could be in the Supreme Court and never pass the bar or went to law school. There's not even an age or citizenship requirement. Before we get into it today, this video is sponsored by Ground News. Ground News is not a news source, but a news aggregator that looks at 50,000 news outlets from around the world and helps you consume the news better. It has a blind spot report feature that identifies the recent news events that receive the most lopsided coverage. It also shows you how the same story is being covered across the political spectrum and from around the world. As a teacher and former journalist myself, Ground News is one of the most important news resources I've ever seen. It has been used in high school and university classrooms as an invaluable tool to help them learn about media literacy, media bias and social media bubbles, and how it can alter their perceptions of the world. Try it out. It's available on iOS, Android, and any web browser. You can also download the Ground News app. Check out the link in the description of this video, but it's just ground.news. Okay. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Since 1790, there have been 115 Supreme Court justices, and here are my top 10. But first, What's my criteria? What are my standards here? I actually put together a spreadsheet to help me tally points based on my three standards. Standard number one, did I agree with how they decided in cases? If I agreed with how the justice decided in the case, I gave them a point. Granted, these are cases that I knew a lot about. Obviously, I couldn't look at every Supreme Court case in history. My second standard was leadership ability. Did this justice have integrity? Was this justice principled? Did they they ignore partisanship in politics? Did they have a consistent interpretation of the U.S. Constitution? If the answer was yes to all these questions, they got some more points. Now, does that mean this list is made up entirely of chief justices? Actually, no. Several of them are not. They are associate justices who often were just as influential as chief justices throughout American history. My third standard was impact. If a justice had tremendous impact in the direction of not only the courts, but of the entire government and even country, they also got points. Clear as mud? Wonderful. Then let's do this. Here are my top 10 Supreme Court justices in American history. In my opinion, of course. Number 10, Joseph Story. Probably most famous for his role in the Amistad case, Story was a member of the Supreme Court for more than 33 years and was greatly influential while there. He is also remembered for his opinion in the landmark case Martin versus Hunter's Lessee. It was during his time on the court from 1812 all the way to 1845 that its power greatly expanded. Story's three-volume book, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States, 
States, was also influential in law schools across the country. He was a staunch defender of property rights and republicanism. So you may have not heard of him, but several historians have argued that he freaking reshaped the law. I'm not storying ya. True story. Sorry about that. Number nine, Antonin Scalia. Yeah, this is probably my most controversial pick as Scalia, even today, several years after his death, remains a polarizing figure. Scalia was a member of the court for more than 29 years. Known as a conservative originalist justice, I would argue that he was actually much more complex than that. Originalism is a type of judicial interpretation of the Constitution that attempts to follow how it would have been either understood or intended to be understood at the time it was actually written. Okay, sure, Scalia may have constantly praised originalism, but in reality, his interpretation of the Constitution was often not originalist at all. This is a good thing, okay? I think he made lots of great decisions that were always well thought out. Scalia was passionate, but not a partisan. He criticized supposed allies just as much as he criticized supposed adversaries. That's right, he was a rogue, and also one of the most influential justices of the last 100 years. Who is number eight? Well, I'll know it when I see it. Ah yes, there it is. Number eight, Potter Stewart. Yeah, he's the dude who said, quote, I know it when I see it, when referring to obscene stuff in movies, in the case Jacob Bellis versus Ohio. Well, despite that silly line, I agreed with his decision in that case, as well as a lot of cases, which is why he's even on this list. In his nearly 23 years as a member of the Supreme Court, he consistently made the right call time and time again, especially for big cases like Matt versus Ohio, Kathy versus United States, Loving versus Virginia, and Lemon versus Kurtzman. Stewart was a moderate voice who often became a swing justice later in his career, meaning sometimes he sided with the conservative wing of the court, and other times he sided with the liberal wing of it. Overall, though, he might just be the most pragmatic Supreme Court justice in American history. And similar to Stewart, here's another justice whom I agreed with on many decisions. Number seven, Byron White. White was a member of the Supreme Court for more than 31 years, from 1962 to 1993. Fun fact, before he got into law, he was a professional football player. Yep, he played in the NFL for one season back in 1938. He got the nickname Wizard as a football player, and that nickname stuck with him even when he was on the bench. I mean bench as in Supreme Court. Wizard was one of the smartest hardest justices in Supreme Court history, but also one of the most humble. He was not ideological at all, and it was often difficult to predict how he would decide in cases. He seemed to truly view each case separately, which to me was a refreshing change for the court. Number six, John Marshall Harlan. Not to be confused with John Marshall Harlan II, his grandson who also served on the Supreme Court. This guy is another underrated justice who has only recently got some love. First of all, he was a member of the court for even longer than Joseph Story, 34 years from 1877 to 1911. Harlan was a constant voice of reason on the bench when reason wasn't common on the bench. He was the lone descendant center in the civil rights cases in Plessy v. Ferguson. Heck yeah, dude. Taking a stand against racial discrimination and the full implementation of the 14th Amendment before it was cool. He also dissented in the case United States v. E.C. Knight Company, which greatly limited the power of the federal government to carry out antitrust enforcement. He was the first Supreme Court justice to call for incorporating the guarantees in the Bill of Rights into the Due Process clause of the 14th Amendment. No matter what the case, he consistently had sympathy for the economically disadvantaged while also constantly justifying the federal government stepping in when the state governments acted up. Number five, Thurgood Marshall. 
He was good. Marshall is well known as the first African-American member of the Supreme Court. Many also know that he had a rockin' career before as executive director of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, during which he argued cases before the Supreme Court, like Smith v. Allwright and Brown v. the Board of Education. But just as freaking important, during his 24 years in the court, he was a champion of individual rights and especially the First Amendment. Sure, statements like, quote, you do what you think is right and let the law catch up, made it seem like he was nothing but a judicial activist. And yeah, he certainly sometimes was, but he was remarkably consistent with his rulings, generally erring on the side of individual freedom. When it came to the First Amendment, he came up with a way to determine whether or not a law against free expression was against it based on the opinion of its content or was simply just generally neutral on expression. He also helped expand freedom of speech for students, as seen with the landmark case Tinker versus Des Moines. He extended freedom of speech protections to prisoners and even obscene material. He also expanded freedom of the press protections. Throughout his entire career, it was all about shifting the power from big institutions in the government to the individual. Number four, Earl Warren. Sure, I'm not a fan of Warren as a governor, and I know very little about his time as the Attorney General of California. However, I'm a fan of Earl Warren for how he used the Supreme Court to transform the country for the better. So many Supreme Court decisions that had a tremendous impact on American life happened when he was the Chief Justice, and like few others in American history, he was successful at convincing the court to unite. He was a a member of the Supreme Court for less than 16 years, but he had more of an impact than those who were there twice as long as him. Sure, the Warren Court marked a bit of a liberal shift, but today we recognize it as a shift that was desperately needed. And we're talking about some big time decisions here, many of which were unanimous thanks to him. Brown versus the Board of Education, Miranda versus Arizona, Gideon versus Wainwright, Engel versus Vitale, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Warren wrote the majority opinions in many of those cases as well. He helped create a due process revolution of sorts, making decisions that led to more equality, individual dignity, expanded criminal justice reforms, and more fair representation in state legislatures. Did he do too much? Did he legislate from the bench? Well, you could actually argue that for most Supreme Court justices, so I'll hold off on answering that. I mean, both liberals and conservatives have given Warren love over the years, and hardly any of his decisions have ever been overturned. He was finally able to get Bill of Rights protections applied to state and local governments, and he was able to unite the court around him in order to do it. For that, I thank him. Number three, William Douglas. Douglas served as a member of the Supreme Court longer than anyone else in American history. 13,358 days. Holy crap. FDR nominated him in 1939, and he was still on the bench when Gerald Ford was president. Counting them all up, I agree with how Douglas decided in most cases. If he was around today, conservative critics might call him a member of the, quote, radical left. But I think Time Magazine was more accurate back in 1975 when they called him, quote, the most doctrinaire and committed civil libertarian ever to sit on the court. Civil liberties were indeed his thing. Like Thurgood Marshall, he was a passionate defender of individual freedoms, especially First Amendment rights. He was famous for being a hardliner on freedom of speech in particular, even defending hate speech and speech that many argued led to violence. I love this quote by him. Quote, free speech has occupied an exalted position because of the high service it has given our society. Its protection is essential to the very existence of a democracy. It has been the one single outstanding tenet that has made our institutions the symbol of freedom and equality, unquote. Because he was very vocal about his beliefs and often commented about politics, even aspiring to be a politician himself, he was definitely a controversial figure who some in Congress tried to impeach. But you know what? I mostly agree with his beliefs. 
There, I said it. He was also one of the hardest working Supreme Court justices in history, publishing over 30 books over his career. Oh dang, we got another William. Number two, William Brennan. Hugely influential, Brennan was a member of the Supreme Court for nearly 34 years. Brennan was similar to Douglas, but more polished, eloquent, and well-read. He had very similar beliefs to Douglas, mainly with his push to expand individual rights. But unlike Douglas, he was often able to change the minds of his colleagues and wasn't afraid to unite with the more supposed conservative wing of the court, earning the respect of folks like Antonin Scalia. Because of his influence, his colleagues often wanted him to write the opinion of landmark cases like New York Times versus Sullivan. Oh, I still need to make a video about that case. And Baker versus Carr. Holy crap, I don't have a video about that one either. And Texas v. Johnson. Okay, yeah, check that video out. Oh, and I agreed with Brennan's decisions more than any other Supreme Court justice in American history. Way more often than not, he got it right. And finally, number one, John Marshall, AKA Little John. Yeah, I've always called him that because why not? So yeah, John Marshall is the most important Supreme Court justice in American history. The most influential by far. There's no comparison. He literally made the Supreme Court relevant and gave it power when it really didn't have much before he was there. Separation of powers and the judicial branch actually competing with the executive branch and legislative branch, that's because of him. He remains the longest serving chief justice and fourth longest serving justice, period, serving for more than 34 years. During his time on the bench, the court greatly expanded the role of the national government at the expense of states' rights. It started with Marbury v. Madison, the most important Supreme Court case in American history, which established judicial review or the ability of the court to determine if something is constitutional or not. Later, cases like McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden dramatically shifted the balance of power to the federal government. Marshall commanded power within the courts and drove that power to the rest of governments, and few saw it coming. And let's face it, without Marshall providing the foundation, none of these other justices on this list would even be relevant. Yo, why do we worry so much about who is in the Supreme Court these days? Lil John. So that's it. Those are my favorite Supreme Court justices in American history. Sure, they all have flaws, but overall, the United States is better for them. I know, I know, y'all predicted Little John would be number one, didn't you? In case you have forgotten, I have a series devoted to important and landmark Supreme Court cases called Supreme Court Briefs. Check out the entire playlist of those episodes in the corner of your screen right now if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're not watching this on YouTube, I'm pointing to the corner of this video like a crazy person. Hey, a shout out to all the honorable mention Supreme Court justices who didn't quite make my top 10 list. Louis Brandeis, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Anthony Kennedy, and John Paul Stevens. Oh, and hey, I've posted my Supreme Court justice scorecard in the description of this video so you can see how they all did. Keep in mind that it doesn't have every Supreme Court justice in American history on that list, and I wasn't able to look at every decision that every justice made on that list because that would be insane for real. So what do you think? Who is your favorite Supreme Court justice in American history? Should I make a, another video looking at the worst? Should I just keep it positive? That was a lot of questions, but maybe if you want to answer one of those questions in the comments below, I would appreciate it. Also, apparently there are a lot of folks who regularly watch my videos but are not subscribed to the channel. So if you could please subscribe and maybe hit the like button or dislike button or share this video with your grandma, uh, hit the notification bell. These are things that I should say more often, but I don't. Now you don't have to do any of that, what I just told you, but I am going to stare at you now and make you feel guilty if you don't. Do it.